Hello, this is John Reed from Sapphire Orlando 2024, and I have returning champion Brian Bennett. How you doing? Good, man. It's good to see you. Good to be back. So Brian and I only know a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Um, but the reason you say, why is Brian on your podcast? Because, well, first of all, Brian and I have some interesting history that goes way back. We know a lot of interesting same people like Ed Herman, Enterprise Geeks, used to work with him at Colgate Paul Mollif. Yep. But also you tend to be outspoken, have a lot of informed, interesting opinions. And the other thing I like about you is that you spent a lot of time not only in SAP, but outside of SAP. And you've been in startup environments. You pursued AI in the startup context more than once. So you bring this, this perspective of both SAP, but fresh ideas. And I think we need a lot of that. So that's why you're here. Happy to be here. And we're, yeah, we're just about on the wrap of the conference. Uh, unless you're going to celebration night with Disney, this is it for me. I'm not going, so we're done. We're going to try to make sense of what we learned. And you um, have progressed a lot since I last talked with you because you have a new professional affiliation, but you also been spending a lot of time on Rise. So we're going to really get into Rise because Rise is like a really important hot topic for SAP customers. So I'm looking forward to getting into that with you today. Indeed. Yeah. Rise, so. Rise has definitely been a, a hot topic, certainly something that we've been pulled into from many different directions. So I don't know if you have a specific tee up you want. Or yeah. Well, just, just start. To, for just, just give us a quick thing on what you're doing with, um, with Delray, just to give people a context for that. Yeah. So, so Delray is a Australian outfits, uh, owned, um, and founded by another SAP mentor. Uh, and so I've known Chris for, you know, over a decade now. And last Sapphire we connected, he was starting to grow into North America. And so I came on board to help him build the organization, uh, especially in the US. And, and so with that, we've kind of been off to the races, figuring out what's going on in this market, what's SAP up to, what's the customer sentiment, where's the, the needs, where's the gaps. Uh, and ultimately, it's super BTP focused for us. That's really all we're trying to bring to market in North America. And being a BTP specialist, we get roped into all the clean core conversations. And that ultimately leads into the rise conversations. And so I'm pulled into all the rooms to have these discussions, whether it's the customer or SAP, where we're getting pulled into all that dialogue. Yeah. And that was something that stood out to me because Chris, who I know from various mentor things in the past, was in early on BTP and was speaking the knowledge about BTP a long time ago. Yeah. And so I, I've had some great conversation with him. And so that has been an issue that I've had. And it's come up this week, even discussing these issues with SAP leadership, which is in order to get on this clean core journey, quote unquote. And, and get a good result, you do need partners that understand this and also are lined up with this business model. Because this is a different business model on subscription for not just for customers, but for partners. And so I'm really pleased that you're making headway there because frankly, SAP needs more partners like that, that are quote unquote, really in on this like you are. So I think that's going to be interesting to hear what you've learned. So, uh, so right. There's a lot to sort of pull out there between those different concepts. But I think the, the one thing I just want to say is that I think this is an interesting show from kind of a SAP perspective, from a tone perspective, and I'm going to be writing about this, but SAP obviously was really in on business AI during a lot of the keynotes. Um, and there was a lot of rise talk, but I think where we didn't hear a lot in the keynotes was this, this sort of conversation around these looming deadlines for older customers and what are customers going to do about that. But I heard plenty of that in the ASA pre-conference day that I attended, including some panels I was on and stuff like that. So it's not like what SAP was saying was not totally relevant, but I think there's this underlying theme of the show, which is going to be our focus today. Uh, we talked a lot last year, I think, about AI stuff, but this year I think we'll focus on this other piece of the puzzle. So so tell me a little bit about just this rise aspect, because what I found from customers is struggling a bit with rise on a couple different levels. And I got this feedback this week as well. But one of the levels was just making sense of the value proposition and how to make it work. There, there was a, still a lot of confusion around who has responsibilities for what in this context, who, you know, hyperscaler SAP customer 
Like, what have you learned around like actually getting a result from Rise and, and where are we there? Yeah. So, so Rise, I think, is both very simple and very complicated depending on, you know, what, what facet you're looking at it uh, from. I mean, like one of the things that we had talked about a little bit already is if SAP had come out the gate and said, you know, Rise is basically us evolving into a SaaS platform and getting customers into a place where they can embrace the the SaaS version of SAP and get that continuous innovation that SAP is going to be delivering, I think that would have been much stronger, much easier to digest messaging than what SAP ultimately put into the market. I think a lot of customers feel like Rise is the commercial vehicle by which they are forcing them to swerve with the looming deadline. And ultimately, I think there is some truth to that, but I do think that that is a fraction of the value add that SAP is actually presenting. I just don't think they've done the best of jobs in terms of telling that story. And when you talk about Rise, I think a lot of customers still view Rise as basically just a commercial vehicle. And, you know, I think SAP has really been struggling to build out that Rise vision, articulate what Rise is really supposed to be. But it is a journey, right? Like that's that is something that I think a lot of people have acknowledged for quite some time. And it is a journey between the customer, the hyperscaler, SAP, and ultimately, in many cases, the incumbent SI. And between that that uh, foursome, there's the song and dance to get you across a finish line where you're now in a good place. You've you've done a transformation. You've adopted this clean core philosophy, and now you can mainline the innovation that's coming out of SAP moving forward. Um, so I think that that is another message that has been put forth in some rooms, but not all rooms. I don't think that was clearly articulated, but more recently. And by more recently, I mean, like basically this morning, I had a meeting and I, I want to make sure I get his name right. It's uh, Wylan Schreiner, um, who he was one of the guys behind uh, S4 HANA. And then he was leading um, the uh, AMS initiative. And now he's getting more involved in the Rise piece. And his vision is the most complete and comprehensive that I've heard to date. And I think it will become the version that SAP starts to push out into the market. And his vision is basically SAP being a continuous improvement cycle moving forward. So the first cycle of innovation that you'll do will ultimately be what we're currently calling Rise. But then it is continue innovation from that day forth. And it is a combination of using um, AMS, it is Signavio, it is Lean IX, it is BTP and the build stack and all those things in conjunction, you're constantly monitoring your landscape, you're understanding where the opportunities are, you're developing a plan around how to um, extend to take advantage of those opportunities, and then you're building that out, and then you're seeing the ramification of those innovations that you've built out or the SAP has delivered that you've started to embrace. And that comprehensively, I think, turns into a pretty sexy narrative that has a lot of value add for a lot of customers. Yeah. So one thing that I, that I've seen, you know, I've been a pretty big critic of rise in a lot of ways, I think, but one thing that I've seen is with the developments you're referring to, as they start to get a little more baked into this service offering, I guess you could call it. There's more differentiation there I see than before, because before I kind of looked at it like, okay, when it, when it was launched, they called it transformation as a service, which was confusing for people to get back to your point. But what it really felt like at the beginning was a hyperscaler management program to me. And now um, I think it's evolved from that. It still is that, right? Because they are managing Absolutely. that. But, but now they're saying we have a bunch of technical and business services to help you manage your landscape, like you're saying, in more of a continuous way. And these are services that you couldn't get if you just went dir right directly to a, a cloud provider. They might have some of them in some ways, but they don't have what SAP is trying to say is we have some that are really specific to your needs and your SAP environments. Yeah. And I really like that that aspect of it. And I think there's that's going to be really interesting to see the progress SAP makes there. The, there are, the issue I have, though, is, and this is something I want to get into a little bit later in our discussion, is... I think Rise has also unquestionably become a licensing vehicle. And in some cases, it's become kind of a barrier to what customers want to do in terms of accessing new innovations and functionality. In other words, 
if I want to do AI, I want to do AI. I don't want to necessarily have to do rise to do AI. And so the way SAP has done that has definitely created friction for and, and, and issues for customers. And so that's a really potent and interesting conversation. But one thing I do think is important to say is that one of the reasons that Rise happened is because a lot of early SAP customers that moved to S4, moved to S4 and then didn't move again. And that doesn't work. Like that doesn't work for SAP. SAP can't make that work from a market perspective. They can't make that work from a Wall Street perspective. And so some of the pressure comes from the fact that that customers ended up just upgrading and doing nothing in. And then like ultimately that becomes very problematic for SAP. But I would argue also eventually for customers. I think eventually customers, I think, need to be aggressive about transformation. And if they're not going to aggressively transform their ERP, then they need to say the hell with it and ring fence it and get that over with and focus on what they're really going to innovate on. But just sitting there on those old systems is part of the reason why this happened. So yeah. I mean yeah. Honestly, if we if we think about it through the lens of you stalling out with your ERP, whether it's SAP or anyone else, it's it's not good for the vendor. It's not good for the customer. Yep. The only one, if anyone, it's good for is the big SIs. And yep. and so that yep. I do think is a precarious position that yep. the ERP market has always been in. And now with the the advent of these SaaS models, I think that there's now a a better path forward. And I think a lot of the clean core strategy is, is really just a, from a technical perspective, a new architectural approach to do the same old things. So customers always went in, did their, their Z customizations, tinkered with their SAP uh, installation, however they saw fits. And then with that, they got stuck. And now with the extension framework that they've put forth with uh, the BTP tech stack that they've put forth. You can do those same kind of customizations, but now they are done as extensions as opposed to customizations directly in the core. And so now you get all the same niceties of being able to build out and up from that core ERP offering, but you can do so in a way that doesn't get in the way of that continuous improvement, of those continuous uh, releases that you want to be able to move up and onto. And I do think it's the best of both worlds. I, I just think, again, the, the messaging has not made it so clear that that's really what this is all about. Right. So let's talk about Clean Core for a minute. So I'll give you three choices. Clean Core is A, bullshit. Two, B, a marketing invention for SAP to get people on a lucrative upgrade journey. Or C, a valuable framework for moder modernizing your ERP environment. Yeah, I mean... I'm definitely going to say C all okay. day. And, and you can, why? You can say that That's maybe, fine. My, maybe my, my view is a little biased as a BTP-focused partner. Yeah. Um, but, but the reality is, is that Clean Core, I think, is a healthy foundational practice to go after, right? It's like you as, you know, like I, I started my career at Colgate, right? You, you mentioned that earlier. Colgate makes toothpaste. And, and we would repeat that to ourselves frequently when we were in the thick of a messy project. And when you're making toothpaste, not every piece of your business process necessarily matters that much. You have to do it all. It's table stakes. But you're not necessarily trying to innovate everywhere all the time. You're not trying to necessarily squeeze out every last bit of efficiency out of every part of every process. You don't necessarily need to customize every bit of every process because at the end of the day, a lot of what you're doing isn't that special. And, and so starting from the first principle of there are ubiquitous best practices in terms of how to run your enterprise. And if you start from there and now you go, all right, there are cost savings opportunities and there are opportunities for us to develop competitive advantages. And now we can take our shots at where we want to pursue that and in a, in, in a measured and technically sound fashion. And that's really what Clean Core is about, is let's get the first principles done and now let's be deliberate in terms of where we are going to do customizations, i.e. extensions, in order to go after the real value that the enterprise should be pursuing. Right. And I tend to look at Clean Core like almost beyond SAP as just a way of thinking about technical debt in an enterprise landscape. Absolutely. And, Great way to frame it. And, and that technical debt comes at a cost, but modernization carries its pros and cons also, right? And so you, you have to, which is one reason why I've been such an advocate about getting partners like yours more visibility is because you do need help on this journey. And I think you need a different kind of partner too, because you need a partner that 
that doesn't just take your code customization work happily and say, I'll go build this for you. You need a partner that says, look, here's a good thing to build and here's why. And here's a thing that, that you should stick with standard on and here's why. And maybe it's because it's part of the roadmap that's coming in six months and you know that. Or maybe it's something where you can tell them other people in your industry are doing the same thing. Just stick with standard on this. It doesn't matter. You know, and that was one of the best conversations I had on the first day at ASUG was how do we differentiate with BTP and, and where? And I think maybe we should talk about that in a minute or two. But, but that to me is the interesting thing. My question for you as an experienced BTP person is, are you finding that this is holding true? In other words, like if I adhere closer to over time to a cleaner core and then I, I turn to BTP when I want to extend the product in certain ways, like, and I build an app or two on BTP or, or you build me one or I build some extensions there, when it comes time to do upgrades and such, is my integration and testing burden easier with BTP than it would have been if I had just built it on my platform. And do you find that it's reduced? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yep. I think the entire tech stack that BTP represents is designed and architected in a way to support the clean core, to right. be uh, a side extension to the, the ERP instance, to the specific LOB instances. Like philosophically, the whole thing is designed to stay out of the way and support. And, and so there's like, still some testing needed though, right? Of course. But of course. it's just dramatic. Would you say it's dramatically reduced or? Yeah. I mean, and again, yeah, a lot of it just comes down to the, the architectural principles it's right. based on. You would have You're to just, adhere to the, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's better housekeeping by, right. by default. Now, if you wildly deviate from BTP best practices, you can find yourself in the same spot because at the end of the day, you're still building software. And if you right. build software poorly, you're going to pay the price for it. But right. as long as you adhere to reasonable best practices, uh, reasonable architectural principles. I, I do think the the path forward, the the burden, the maintenance is all greatly diminished. And going back to the continuous innovation process and right. the the toolkit that SAP has put forth for that, I I do think that um, it is it. There's a lot of uh, turnkey capabilities there in terms of. Uh, your housekeeping, your your gardening of your your landscaping to make all that less burdensome. Right. Okay, that makes total sense. So, what if your experience has been with 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 your customers around what would be examples of without giving away proprietary stuff of good things to use BTP for in the context of a clean core? What would be examples? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's still all the same kind of. Um, scenarios, use cases that, that we've always seen, right? So you, you have uh, custom forms that you want to build out that have nuance for what your business is doing, or you have uh, nuance in terms of your safety protocols or whatever the case may be. And so there's, there's a custom screen of some sorts that needs to be leveraged to support or communicate a subset of information. Uh, and I think that you know, there are straightforward ways to approach that, whether it's with uh, BPA, build process automation, or build apps. Um, I think that you know forms is a, a common theme that will always exist. Um, and then you have workflows, right? Like there's the standard processes, but then you might have sub processes that have some nuance to them that might need to handle some edge cases, or maybe you have additional scrutiny over a subset of tasks, and so you want additional layers of approvals. And and so for that, again, you have build process automation where you can spin up these side processes that have the extra hoops that you jump through that then marry back up to the core process very easily. And so mm -hmm. like, I think that that's a, a common design pattern you see. Um, and then you just have the, the, the bigger, meatier custom solutions that you want to support something that is relatively novel about your business. And in those cases, you start to throw more at it. Maybe it's a pro code solution. Maybe you need some integration suites. Maybe there's some analytics heavy lifting involved in that to monitor the solution after the fact or to extract the appropriate value out of it after the fact. And so that turns into something that's a little bit more weighty and a little more comprehensive. But again, at the end of the day, if if I think about the difference between what you're building with BTP and what people used to do with Z code, there's not a whole lot of difference. It's just a difference of tech stack mm -hmm. and a difference of architectural philosophy. Yeah, and it could get interesting in the future because I could see having more of an app store environment for some of this where some things you might you know, pull in applications, you know, from the SAP store or whatever, from partners that are pre-built that multiple customers are using. Again, in areas that are not available through the SAP core, but are not 
truly differentiated areas. So you don't mind if 20 of your competitors were also using it. Yeah. Absolutely. But then there may be stuff in my mind, ultimately you're doing mostly through that kind of stuff, reusing pre-built components. And then you focus your true application building BTP investments on the truly differentiated stuff that only your com I realize that's an idealistic presentation of it, but I think in the long run, that would be the coolest way to go. Oh yeah. You know, well, I mean, to, to kind of extrapolate on that, and I do think the ecosystem will get there. As, as BTP becomes more widely adopted, more widely understood, more widely embraced, I think it's not just customers, it's also partners. It's, yeah. it's the ISVs that will also get on board with leveraging BTP properly and building with BTP properly for those app listings and whatnot. And what you're going to end up seeing is that you might have uh, third-party solutions that solve a niche thing and they're deployed in such a way that it's very easy for you to wrap it and then build on top of that. So now you might be extending on top of SAP plus a third-party solution with a little bit of your own uh, niceties on top of it, and it'll all feel relatively lightweight and easy to approach. And then you've got the, the business hub that SAP has built out, the accelerator hub. And I think that we'll see a point eventually where customers will say, hey, I went on that journey. I built that thing. I've put together some templates, and I've shared them. And you can take them and skip steps one through three on your 10-step journey to build out that custom solution. I think that uh, even SAP is putting together a lot of those things. Um, and Signavio points in that direction of, hey, we're seeing this thing in your process. We know that the, these things that ex exist in the Accelerator Hub, go turn those things on and it'll get you 80% of the way there. And then from there, you can think about extending it further. I think all of this stuff turns into a flywheel that's just going to make innovation easier and easier to find to share and to build upon. And I'm also going to point out, I think this is part of a blurring of the lines between business, business and technical stuff in the sense that, like, I've been telling SCB for years, and I'll say it again on this podcast, and I said it this week, which is next year's keynotes, bring a few partners on stage that have built some kick-ass stuff on BTP and do it at Sapphire. You said you know? it, not me, but absolutely. Do it. Yeah. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not necessarily plugging you guys, but, but, you know, cool vendors that do this stuff, like, like put them on stage and and fire up the imagination of customers on what's possible here, and and quit telling me that this is a tech ed thing. This is right. I mean, this is an every customer thing for sure. You uh, know, the the way that I would frame it is, I think there needs to be a little bit more practicality in the messaging. I I think real use cases, real solutions, something that's a little bit more grounded. Right. And yeah, I think BTP use cases. I think you need to see more of that. Um, but even on the AI side, I, I had a, a meeting with Walter Sun today and we were talking about this and, you know, we, we all can acknowledge that Gen AI is very exciting and LLMs are opening all sorts of doors and they're, they're very tantalizing and customers are highly enamored with it right now, but there's a whole lot of value to be captured in less sexy AI approaches, less sexy ML and statistically derived solutions that are really going to uh, supercharge the enterprise, right? Like if you think about just the process automation use cases that are out there, they're not necessarily tied to LLMs. Like let's talk a little bit more about that stuff. Let's let's bring everyone back down to earth a little bit because there's a lot of value that we're overlooking because we're all fixating a little too much on the new and shiny. Yeah, and unfortunately we don't have time for full full keynote reviews because of the things I want to talk to you about. But uh, but yeah, I thought I thought there was a little too much of that um, in the keynotes though. Uh, I did see, especially today, I really thought the customer um, interviews in today's keynote with um, Scott and Thomas were good. They were in-depth and they went into the rise and grow scenarios. And then there was a really good clean core discussion with Hitachi despite some language barriers. So I thought, I thought SAP did a good job. Like if you really consider today's keynote as part of the mix, um, I thought, I thought they got off to a little bit of a rough start for the reason you're describing with like, kind of like whoa, everything's changing and AWS and, you know, NVIDIA are awesome and Apple built these weird glasses and maybe someday someone's going to use them. Oh, sorry, Apple. Um, <laughs> I, I think eventually there'll be a good use case for the Vision Pro. It's just a little bit like, I think it's tough to pull the goggles out when people are struggling with big macroeconomic uncertainty. For sure. So, you know, but anyway, I thought SAP righted the ship a little bit today and then also... Getting to your point, the the when Natasha came on stage to talk about spend management, that's when it started to resonate with me a little bit in terms of like, okay, here's how customers can use some of the automation you're describing to really change how they deal with the pain points around procurement and 
I mean, purchasing and, and all that stuff and managing suppliers is just a core issue. Yeah. And so, oh, yeah. my battery's running low on the laptop. That's really awesome. Uh oh. My, uh, my Dell battery decided that this was the trip where it was going to reduce capacity by like 75%. Oh, yeah. That's always fun. I wish I was on a rise contract because SAP could have helped me with that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so just, just back to our topics du jour, uh, rise. So I think one interesting thing, um, was kind of looking at what some of the benefits are for customers. And I think it's going to be really interesting in a year or two to see what comes of the benefits because so far, I feel like a lot of the benefits come down to putting yourself in a better position for the future. Like I interviewed a customer today and they went on to rise and it was a good experience as far as they were tired, like a ridiculous amount of legacy systems, like more than 20. Yep. And they just had a mess on their hands and they went on to rise and also they had things like SAP Analytics Cloud and other capabilities that they put into place. And it was cool to hear their story, but talking with them about the benefits, they were kind of like, we had to do this. We were basically a mess. Um, and by the way, they weren't running SAP ERP at all. It was a greenfield thing. But, um, but I thought what was interesting was talking with him about what's next because I want to track this customer in a year or two because... Now they're in a position to, for example, absorb new AI functionality, though most of the new Gen AI stuff is mostly still with a with the public cloud and SaaS stuff that SAP is rolling out. But other forms of AI, which you referred to, are available for a variety of S4 customers. And, and I think they're in a position now to start thinking about this journey from a transactional system to like now we have a ton of data in the analytics cloud. We can use that to take a look at what our customers are doing and, and how to better support our suppliers. And like, I think it's going to be really interesting to see these journeys because my bet is that the rise stories will get a lot more interesting from that perspective in a year or two, because it feels like the first thing you're doing is more, a little bit more like cleaning house and getting ready to absorb innovation. I don't know if you have that same perception, but that's kind of what I'm seeing. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I think this the, the rise transformation journey is is a big lift. And while I think everyone wants to see a lot of innovation come with that first innovation cycle, I I understand that that's tough because there's a lot of house cleaning that you're going to be doing during that initial rise process, the the initial fit to standard clean core approach that you need to take and that's going to require a significant amount of your attention. And at the end of the day, I can see why for a lot of customers that can be a little deflating, but I do think that there's a tremendous amount of value in going through that process because it, it is the enabler. It's the first step for all the innovation that you're going to do moving forward. And if you think right. about, you know, when you owned ECC and you had to start planning on when is it that you're going to draw the line in the sand and start saying, all right, this is when we're going to start planning for doing our migration, accepting those releases. Um, that was an ongoing headache where you had to constantly make decisions and constantly pay the piper uh, via all the calories burned internally to do those little uh, upgrades. And in this case, you're going to do it one more time. It's going to hurt. And then when it's done, you will never have to go through that truly, again, at least not for the foreseeable future. And everything moving forward, assuming you architect everything correctly, Assuming you adhere to best practices, it's all innovation opportunities. It's what's SAP going to deliver? How fast is it going to deliver it? What's on the roadmap? What should we get excited about? What we sh should we build around? And then what can we start doing ourselves? Because we don't have to worry about anything other than innovation moving forward. I think it is going to be very exciting when customers get on the other side of it and realize that the old problems do not exist. And the new problems are focusing on which innovations matter most. Yeah, and I think that's probably going to help the whole community with the business case problems around Rise a bit when they can see more of that, right? Because not every customer has a completely unmanageable legacy landscape. Some customers feel like they're, it's almost like, I mean, my friend Josh Greenbar wrote this post about the pickup truck. He compared like pickup trucks to SAP ERP, and then he compared like the the Grow was like a little sports car. It wasn't a sports car, but a Toyota, whatever. Like, 
the whole thing is like, okay, you have this engine that runs and some customers view their ERP system like that. It like it runs, it never breaks. And, and it never breaks is a really big deal, by the way. And the fact that it runs is a big deal. Like for SAP sure. doesn't ever get enough credit for building shit that just runs and runs and runs. Yep. Like, and I think we underestimate that sometimes in our trendy market analysis amongst my peers. Yeah. Well, it's but so easy to take for granted, right? It's, it is. You, things that don't create problems, you don't think about, right? Squeaky right. wheel gets the, the, the grease. So anyway, when you take customers like that and they're sitting here saying, well, why do I need to move at this point? I think those business benefit stories as, as customers get further along this path, like you're saying, of, of you're ready for what's next. As you start seeing examples of what that what's next looks like, I think that's going to get people excited, like in a way that just knowing, oh, I'm going to get access to AI. Okay, that's cool. I think most people would want access to AI, but that's not, I'm sorry, that's not a business case per, per se. Yeah, I, I don't you know? disagree. I, I, I came into the Sapphire with an axe to grind specifically around the value story that SAP did or in many cases did not put together. Because at the end of the day, I think there's a nice qualitative story. I think there's a future state that's very attractive and you can do a lot of storytelling around about why the customer should be excited. But the, the financial side of it, the, the why now and how to justify, I think at the end of the day, SAP to date has done a relatively poor job of, of building that, that value management case. The, they have not done the value engineering to really defend what's the value of clean core, how to define and measure a clean core so you can know whether or not you're getting enough out of it or how much more you have to push for fit to standard to really see the level of value that you were anticipating to start to talk about how it's going to impact uh, the DevOps burden that will shuffle and likely lighten for you over time. Like there's all these little value stories that are part of the Rise journey that need to be enumerated, articulated, and calculated. And I think SAP is understanding that this is something that the onus is on them to do it, and they have not done it to date, and they have some catch-up to do, but there's acknowledgement that they are in a place where they should start doing it, where they are capable of doing it, and so now it's just about doing the work. And the fact that they've started to put together this continuous innovation uh, vision of Rise, I now think they have a healthy foundation to work off of as they start to build the quantitative value engineering required to help customers understand and rationalize this decision. So you said you had an ax to grind coming into the show. Has have, have things shifted for you at all on the ground? Uh, only in the sense that there is genuine and sincere acknowledgments that they have not done a good job to date. And I did not know how it was going to be received. When I came in swinging, telling them they've done a bad job on this front. And at the end of the day, I think there's been so many moving parts. Uh, it's been such frenetic activity around uh, the looming deadlines and the demands for AI capabilities. Um, you know, the, it just seems like there's always been a, a fire to put out. And, and so I think now is a moment to take a deep breath and and realize that this is happening there's there's still time but the log jam is going to form and so we need to really put our house in order and help it help customers uh be in a position where this decision is not a hard decision to make because at the end of the day from my perspective technically speaking this should be an easy decision that there should be a legitimate cost saving story to be told around fit to standard around clean core and sap has just made it hard for customers to understand and see what that value story is. Right. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I have seen some interesting progress along those lines myself, like, because in the, a couple of years ago with Rise, I, I just picked up on a lot of confusion around like, who owns what in the relationship? What, what, what does SAP do? What does the hyperscaler do? What does the customer do? I even heard an anecdote about a customer trying to track it on a spreadsheet, which is not obviously where you want to go. Um, but but I had a really interesting conversation with a customer today that taught. I asked him that, and he he said like actually like that that's gone well, and they had to kind of stick stick with it uh, and kind of work it out. He pointed out choosing the right partner. He chose a Rise Experience partner, for example, that was a key part of the plan. But he also said that SAP had a 
a particular kind of um, person on the ground. I'm looking for the name of it, but it, it was like a, I don't, sorry folks, I don't have the name in front of me, but it's like an ultra care or whatever, but it's like an early phase rise thing where they make sure that they have someone from SAP on the ground until everything is kind of set with that. And I was impressed to hear that. And that constituted progress in my book from some of the things I've heard before. And so it will be interesting to see what progress is made now. Like, so a couple of quick questions for you. Um, clean core dashboard, marketing gimmick or another sign of improvement? I, I think it is the start of the right toolkit that SAP should have probably put together two, three years ago. That was a very carefully put, but I like that. So, <laughs> so you're giving them minor, minor credit for like getting in the right yeah. direction. Uh, maybe maybe okay. a bronze star, not a gold star. Okay. And what do you think about enterprise architect on every rise project? Uh, I do think that that makes sense because at the end of the day, this is a big weighty transformation process. And so even if at the end of the day, you, you go brownfields and you cut a bunch of corners and you kick the can on some of these things, you want to know what you're getting into. And so having someone there in the conversation that understands how it's all going to come together and and where the the rickety parts are going to be depending on decisions you make depending on corners you possibly cuts i think that is going to be invaluable for the customer over the long term to know what they're getting into and to have a sense of what they're going to run into in the future okay um one more quick one which is on grow uh my big surprise of the show was Hearing some, well, not so much grow. I don't think these customers were all grow. Some of them were, but some of them were just public cloud customers that came along before grow, but telling good stories, like, like, and, and kind of like showing, displaying a passion for the product that I have not seen in a long time in the SAP world. Like in the SAP world, I still sometimes see passion from a community perspective, not quite as intensely as I once did from the old school days of the enterprise geeks and stuff, but I definitely see some community passion. I saw some of that at this year's show as well, but product passion is a little bit different and it, you don't see it that often, not just at SAP, but at a lot of shows. I mean, it's, it, I don't see that that often where, where, and I saw it with, with some public cloud customers at this show and that woke me up a little bit. And I pointed that out to some people at SAP who are kind of aware of it too. And they're starting to realize like maybe this is a bigger deal than we kind of realized. And I, you're seeing it a little bit on the keynote stages now, like, like, like the public cloud got a fair amount of attention this week on the keynote stage. And even though they largely talk about it as a mid-marketed subsidiary play, that's not entirely true. I mean, there's still a lot of industry questions a customer would have to ask, I think, for a lot of industries. Um, but certainly in the service industry, they put PwC up there. They're running it at scale globally, so in services, but obviously that was obviously a core industry from the beginning. I used to see this kind of passion a little bit, believe it or not, from by design customers, but it was kind of like this, it wasn't quite the same, but it was like this product really works for us. We like it. Yep. And and we don't care what anyone else thinks. We think it's cool. But, but the public cloud thing was different because I saw a, a customer on the public cloud challenging customers in the room who had not chosen between public and private to say, go public and here's why. And here's, it's so much easier to consume this. We get AI before anybody else. We, you know, blah, blah, blah. We connect easily to these other services. He had all these like reasons. And I was like, okay, like, and I think that's going to be really interesting. And, and I understand why SAP can't just like put all its eggs in that basket by any means, because a lot of its customers are going to need to do this gradual clean core transition and stuff like that. Yep. But I just wanted to mention it because I, I was surprised by it. And he was challenging customers like, some of you are just afraid of the public cloud and you shouldn't be. It's a better place to be. And I think that's really interesting. And it will be interesting to see how, you know, if there's tension between those things going forward and how that works. So anyway, I just yeah. thought it was interesting. Yeah, no, and I agree. I mean, like, I think there's a lot of variation by industry. But if you think about the long tail of SAP customers, we we really think about the the top of it, right? The the biggest, meatiest, most complex customers are the ones that really get all the attention. But the long tail is just as valid, right? It's like, they're customers too. They want to be taken care of. And as you go down that long tail, I think you shed some of that complexity. 
And, and I think public cloud makes more and more s- sense the further you go down that long tail on average. Again, there's industry variation there. Um, but when it works, I think it works fantastic, right? Because that's SAP's bread and butter. It's always been SAP's bread and butter. And, and so it's no surprise that from a, a functional perspective, they feel like they, they're taken care of because SAP has been at the forefront of building those best practices for decades, for five decades. And, and so, of course, when you step into that, it's like, oh, this makes sense. And some of these processes are better than what we thought about doing beforehand. And if you, if you look at the other side on the technical side, SAP's done a lot of work, right? If you think about the Fury strategy, the, the UX thoughtfulness that they've put into this, the, the cohesiveness of, of that vision, the, the idea of these work zone user portals to allow the, the user to feel like there's something that's tailor-made to them that has all the right functionality at their fingertips. There's, there's layers of what SAP has built on the technical side to make all this make more sense. And if it fits for you, public cloud, one press of a button, all of that turns on for you. So yeah, it should be a huge win for a lot of customers. Absolutely. Okay, so the wrap. So for listeners, just a few things I wanted to mention. One is just to acknowledge both ASUG and especially also SAP. ASUG, I got some amazing insights into customers this week. And then from the pre-conference day, because obviously the ASUG annual conference takes place here co-location. Planning to go to ASUG Tech Connect in the fall because that was a really cool show to continue with that. Um, but then also um, SAP like allows me to like press these issues with executives and get this kind of information that I can have these kinds of discussions. And so not every vendor does that. And not every vendor lets me kind of go after it like I do with SAP. And I think that that's a credit to the company because even though like I said, I have a lot of issues with Rise and we didn't even get into the full like innovation debate, but I've covered that in other podcasts. Like the fact that we can have this kind of dialogue, I think is really healthy and it's a good sign for the community. Uh, it, for those of you who want more on business AI, they will have to cover that another time. Um, but I've written a bunch on this topic and I interviewed Walter's son. So I also met with Walter. So I got some fresh content for you. I'll write about. And then the same with Walk Me. I've got some thoughts on that, and I gathered some comments on that. So that'll be my next article on Diginomicus, but we're not going to talk about that today. So, Br- Brian, uh, close us out. Uh, any final words, surprises, thoughts from the show, something we didn't cover you wanted to mention? Uh, I mean, I, I, I feel like I have failed to be the curmudgeon I usually am when I come yeah. on this uh, podcast with you. I think we've just picked topics where, at the end of the day, I do think SAP, while doing an imperfect job, I think is doing a job that really warrants them getting some credits. Um, but I do think that there's areas where I would still like to see improvements. Like I, I think that's, you know, we'll, we'll have to do this another time. So maybe yeah. we'll have to book a second one of these. Yeah. Uh, but on the partner side, I think that there's a lot of things that need to be unpacked. I don't think uh, the boutique partners are getting the spotlight they deserve. I think that there's still a gap in the market. I think there was so much consolidation and now it's the big SIs and the boutiques and not enough in between. Um, and it doesn't really feel like there's a path there for partners to grow into that space easily. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, SAP is making some of that stuff harder than it should be. Uh, but that feels like a, a whole dialogue that we could do another time. Yeah. Uh, but I do feel like a lot of the themes that are reinforcing that's uh, resurfaced in this Sapphire. And so it's frustrating to see SAP making many of the same mistakes when it comes to how they shepherd their partner ecosystem. Yeah. And I just released a podcast with, uh, Jeff Scott of a and Josh on partners and what's the role of partners in the innovation strategy. And we probably need to flesh that out some more. So maybe we'll do that another time. Cause that's a really, really key topic. Um, but one of the reasons why I want to talk with you was so we could at least have a voice from that perspective. So that's really great. And yeah, I I feel you on the curmudgeon um, aspect, like finding the right balance, but I think also it's not interesting to just be down on companies and down on the market. And so I'm always personally trying to find that balance. And it's not always easy because especially going from show to show the way I do, like there's so much propaganda that at some point I start to just get overdosed yeah and then at the same time like i don't want to lose track of the whole reason why we got into this field to begin with was to change the workplace change people's lives in some way like that's why at least i don't know about you but that's why i wanted to do this in the first place 
if I didn't feel that was possible, then it wouldn't, it would just be like a, a just a, just a cynical money grab. And believe me, there's not that much money, <laughs> money yeah. in my line of work for that. It's not worth it for that. So yeah, if you're always negative, it's hard to have a positive impact. Yeah. So we have to find that balance. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I feel you because you have a natural commodity tendency, but at the same time, now you're in a position where you're evangelizing stuff that you believe in. So you have to find that balance and, but that's healthy. That's good. So you still kept it real. I knew you would. So <laughs> appreciate. It. Anyway, hope y'all enjoyed that and uh, uh, catch us again soon. Catch you later.